Thank you, Brent. Hi, my name is Rourke Marks, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about the times just over a year ago that my lung collapsed. Um, times. So just to set the stage a little bit, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story first of uh, how it happened and how I found out about it. Uh, it was December 2012, uh, dark and stormy night. There was something special in the air. Uh, I'd had a cheeseburger. It was after soccer practice. Uh, I drove home, and I was working on my homework. And uh, I had some chest pain. I thought maybe it was just some heartburn, double cheeseburger. I had nothing out of the ordinary. Popped the Tums. Didn't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I woke up the next morning with the same pain. And uh, that's weird. And I skipped soccer practice the next day, and it was starting to get worse, and I was starting to feel it up at the top. It was kind of rising, and I felt it in the back by my shoulder blade. And uh, working on my homework again uh, the next night, and I dropped my pencil just sort of off to the side, and I was in my, in my desk, and I kind of leaned over to get it. And I fell over, and I couldn't pick myself back up. I didn't have the core strength to fight the pain that was in my chest. And so, of course, I informed my mother and she, <laughs> sorry, she politely informed me that we would be going to the emergency room the next morning. Uh, good call. Uh, this is my x-ray, not from the ER. I wish I had that one, but this was after I'd been admitted to the hospital uh, for a collapsed lung. And uh, it, it, ignore that. Uh, this is what they did to treat it. It's really hard to see. I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but it's called a thoracic vent. Uh, and essentially what was happening was it's not like a blowout, it's, it's, it's more of a leak. My lung had sprung a leak, that's why it took me two days to notice it. And I had this pressure building up in what they call my pleural space, the chest cavity. And it's pushing on the lung and collapsing it and pushing on my other organs and it's dangerous. Um, and then this is one I found on the internet that's a, that's a lot more serious, closer to what I would have had in the ER. Uh, you can see here, this is, uh, this is the trachea. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, lateral trachea movement is bad. Uh, and this on the right, this is, you can see the heart a bit better on the right. This is the, the heart moving to the opposite hemithorax, the other half of your chest. And it's obstructing venous return to the heart, so the blood going back to the heart isn't getting to it. So you know, your fingers can turn blue, stuff like that. And uh, of course, despite all this, I wasn't worried, right? I mean. They put the chest, the chest vent in, and I was in the hospital about a week. I just, just played some Xbox, got over it, right? And uh, I was just out in a, in a week, and uh, I didn't follow the rules. This is interesting. They, uh, they told me for about two weeks, three weeks, I think it was, I couldn't lift over five pounds. I wasn't supposed to be lifting with, with my chest or my, my arms, so I was pulling my backpack. Ugh. And... Uh, I was over that in about two days. I mean, I, it's interesting what teenagers do when nobody's looking, right? <laughs> That's, that. And so then, fast forward to February. So that's not even two months, and uh, I have the same chest pain again. I'm, I'm actually talking to my mother this time. And uh, I told a joke, I laughed at my own joke like I always do, and, <laughs> and I let out a really slow exhale kind of like that one you hear in the movie when they're dying. They just, oh. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. It takes a long time. And, uh, and then a really raspy cough right at the end. And I knew that moment that it had collapsed again. It was another pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. Uh, but of course, I had to go to a specialist and get it, and get it confirmed. And uh, I did the next day. And they told me that there was a possibility I could never play contact sports again. I could never run long distance again because it's serious and it, it'll keep happening if we don't get it fixed. So I had to get surgery. And this is just some of the words you can see that I'm saying uh, for the surgery. It's called a thoracotomy with pleuridesis and a blebectomy. Uh, otomy, the, at the end, kind of like appendectomy, means that they're taking something out. So they cut out the part of my lung that was causing the problem, stapled it closed, had a chest tube into the back, and blew talcum powder into my chest cavity to scar the lung to the chest wall. I can still feel it. So the second time wasn't as fun. I was, I was a little more worried. And uh, 
what was really interesting that I didn't notice until I was writing the speech, looking back, was that I was in the cardiac wing with a lot of old 50-year smokers, and it, 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 just, it was a really sad place. And I was 17 years old, grin on my face, eating junk food and playing Xbox for two weeks while my lung re-inflated. And the nurses seemed to act different around me. Um, they seemed to be a little more attentive. Uh, and I didn't really realize this until later, but it was because I was getting better. It was because they weren't used to that. It's some, it was very rare. It's a very rare occurrence. And uh, I didn't really think it was important until now. And so just to show you how rare it is, these are some stats I found. Uh, two out of 100, ten, sorry, 10,000 in the UK are affected by spontaneous th pneumothoraxes. And uh, it's more common in men, according to the NIH, 7.4 to 18 men out of 100,000 in the uh, Americas are affected. And this bleb re-rupture rate, a bleb, I didn't explain to you what a bleb is, that's the, uh, the part that was causing the collapse, it's sort of a, a bubble uh, that they cut out. And the re-rupture rate is anywhere between 13% and 60%. You notice how wide that spread is? <sighs> that's because it's such a rare occurrence that the data to narrow that spread doesn't really exist. So they didn't really tell me that stat when I got out of the hospital the first time. Uh, they just told me to follow the rules. They didn't tell me that it was up to 60% re-rupture rate. And that's why I'm talking about it to you today, uh, is because it's imp this event is important to me because I sort of learned to follow the rules, essentially. I, I, I learned about what I like to call the teenage invincibility complex. I'm sure there's a scientific name for that, but I like the way I call it. And uh, we're all familiar with this. Um, it was brought up in Deepa's speech, actually. You didn't think you were going to get a speeding ticket the first time until you get one. None of us do, right? But it always happens, and then you always start to dial back a little bit after the first speeding ticket. And uh, similarly, it's what they try to sort of condition against in driving school when they show you the drunk driving videos and everything like that, just every day. Just don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, but we're not listening. So that's why this is important to me, because I learned to follow the rules. Thank you.